All right, everyone. So week two, lecture two, multivariate analysis of variance or MANOVA. So MANOVA is what you use when you have one or more nominal between subjects IVs. So uh, things that uh, would be appropriate for ANOVA. But here's what sets it apart. You have two or more DVs. So uh, the DVs have to be measured on an interval or ratio scale. So this is analysis of variance when you've got more than one dependent variable. <laughs> so so last, the, the other one we went over was analysis of variance when you have more than one independent variable. So uh, this is the other thing that frequently happens when you go on for your dissertation. You think you've got one DV, they go, oh, you know what, you should also measure this other thing. And you're like, well, what analysis do I use if I have two DVs? Uh, this one. All right, so the DV should be related in some sort of theoretical manner, uh, similar measures of something, or they they can be they, they can be summed up and have a meaning to them is usually what happens. It's like a total intelligence score, for example. Um, <clears throat> so is it primarily a sense of civic obligation that accounts for whether or not someone votes, or is it their sense of patriotism? So if you hypothesize you know what, the reason people vote is civic obligation. It's not really their sense of patriotism. Um, this is a study that's got more than one DV. So your independent variables, voting status, it's people who voted, people who didn't vote in the last election. Everyone gets two measures that they complete. One is their sense of civic obligation. And that's the primary DV, right? Because you think that's the more important one for uh, differing between these groups. Second DV is sense of patriotism, so also some sort of interval or ratio measure, but that is clearly the secondary DV, so it's not the one you think is the most important. So indeed, if you uh, correlate these, and we're going to do this one as an example, so uh, you find that they have a relationship or a correlation that's positive, 0.53. So um, sense of civic obligation and sense of patriotism are correlated. So um, why not just analyze these DVs separately, right? Why not do multiple ANOVAs or multiple T-tests, call it a day? Why do we have to learn yet one more thing? You knew the slide was coming, right? So number one is the usual. <laughs> Same study, multiple tests uh, are being conducted. Each one of those tests has a type one error rate. They're additive over the family of tests. We call that type one error inflation, or family-wise type one error inflation. And so um, <clears throat> you need to do something that sort of keeps your type one error rate low. Uh, and and you know, this isn't gonna surprise you at all. This is an omnibus test like every other one. So um, multiple ANOVAs will inflate your type one error. Um, another reason that you might want to do uh, or why you should do this test is sometimes you're actually interested in what's called the multivariate effect. And this is a uh, uh, sort of sets MANOVA apart from anything else we, we ever do actually, is that it actually combines the two DVs into a single measure, which is why you want them to be related somehow or sum up to something meaningful. Um, and so uh, the multivariate effect is sometimes of interest in of itself, that combined DV. Um, which we will call the DV centroid or the DV vector. It's sort of both, both or all, if you have more than two DVs put together. So what sometimes happens is, you know, the groups that you're comparing won't differ separately on the DVs, but when you combine them into this, it's actually a three-dimensional sort of centroid. Um, but when you combine the two dependent variables together, you find that they do differ when you combine the two things. So that's the multivariate effect. And um, <clears throat> when you do MANOVA, it accounts for the fact that the, the dependent variables are not independent, they're correlated. I mean, it's implicit actually here, <laughs> or explicit here, that um, there's a correlation between the DVs. And so, you know, to the, to the extent your DVs are measuring the same thing, um, uh, you know, it's sort of like you're analyzing the same data more than once, the same uh, dependent variable. And so uh, when you do MANOVA, it uh, uh, accounts for the fact that there is some correlation between the dependent variables that they share. And uh, you can get a clearer image of how the groups differ because it takes care of that overlapping variability. <clears throat> 
So there is no redundant information included in the overall MANOVA multivariate analysis. So the assumptions, um, independence shouldn't shock you at all. They're independent, different people in the groups, right? Obviously it's the same people answering both or all DVs, but different people in your independent variable groups. Multivariate normality is a little different. Uh, we uh, multi So normal more normality is that each variable is approximately normally distributed for each level of the independent variable. This says that, well, it's probably going to say right here, not only is each DV univariately normally distributed, that combined um, DVs are also normally distributed when it combines them together into that multivariate effect. Um, that's also multivariately normally distributed. And that must be true for each level of the independent variable. So um, the usual non-disclaimer is, uh, like, there's a reason I don't have you check this every time, but I do the homogeneity one. When we do these ANOVAs is that, you know, deviations from normality don't really mess up ANOVAs or MANOVA all that much. So it's, uh, in general, unless things are really bad, MANOVA works. And then we have the homogeneity of covariance matrices. This has two parts. So number one, the variances of all DVs must be similar across levels of the IV. So um, that's just the homogeneity of variances assumption. I don't know why they just call it that on the slide, but that's all this is. So homogeneity of variances assumption. And the second part is that the covariance for DVs must also be similar. So this might ring a bell. This is Mockley's sphericity test, or uh, Mockley, the sphericity assumption that we looked at when we did repeated measures of NOVA. So the assumption, um, so the first one you guys got down, right? The spread of scores for each DV is, is about the same across all uh, levels of the independent variable. Um, number two is that the correlation between um, the scores uh, for the DVs are about the same. So if you had three DVs, for example, the correlation between DV1 and 2, whatever it is, is about the same. Magnitude and size is the correlation between 1 and 3. It's the same as the correlation between 2 and 3. So uh, for practical purposes, um, it's tested with Mockley's sphericity test. So, um, so let's say you're looking at spatial and verbal IQ DVs. So those are the, the uh, dependent variables in your study you're doing. Um, and they are correlated the same for prisoners and non-prisoners in your study. That would be this part of the, the homogeneity of covariances matrices assumption being met. So they should be correlated with each other, uh, spatial and verbal IQs. For prisoners and non-prisoners, if those are the levels of your independent variable, this correlation coefficient should be same magnitude-ish in the same size direction. Sorry. Um, oh no, it's boxes M uh, on this one. So instead of Mockley's first suit test, whatever. So um, uh, we're going to use boxes M to test the homogeneity of covariances assumption. And it's the usual sort of rules. These, these are always those ones you don't want to be significant, right? Because it just means more trouble. So you want boxes M's sig to be less, uh, uh, to be greater than 0.05. If it's less than 0.05, you have violated the homogeneity of covariance matrices assumption. And what's the result of that? Well, um, you lose power. So if your sample sizes are approximately equal, you just get a reduction in power. If if you have uh, markedly uh, different sample sizes and you violate, so your boxes M sig is less than 0.05, you end up with uh, type 1 error inflation. So how do you counter that? Um, you send me an email, but the reality is going to be uh, you're going to use a tighter alpha level, maybe 0.03 or 0.01, something like that. So there are different steps in analyzing MANOVA. So um, uh, it's a little bit different. It's again, we're going to put together multiple things that you've learned in your past um, assignments into a sort of new thing. It's like, it's basically like Taco Bell, how it's really just seven ingredients. And sometimes the cheese is on the outside of the taco and sometimes it's on the inside, right? Same sort of thing where this was going to put together um, uh, ANOVA and then it's going to put together ANCOVA. And you'll see, it all, all makes sense. So first you test for group differences on the combined DVs. That is multivariate tests. You say, okay, do these two groups or three groups, whatever it happens to be, 
um, significantly differ when I combine the dBs into a single centroid or a single three-dimensional mean. So your combo of dBs is called a centroid or a vector. And what that does sort of um, practically is it removes redundancies between the dBs to the extent they overlap with each other. Um, you don't count that overlap twice. You count it just one time. So this combined analysis is what makes the MANOVA special. You get this multivariate test uh, where you say, hey, do they, um, so we just had uh, two IQ measures. You, you get this test that says, do these groups differ, prisoners and non-prisoners, on combined spatial or whatever the heck else it was IQ? You don't get that in any other things. So this is the multivariate test table on SPSS that we normally ignore. <laughs> we're actually we're finally going to look at it. Um, and there are four different lines in there that uh, are, are, are uh, types of multivariate tests. You got to pick one. So there's one called the hoteling tra hotelling's trace. Hotelling's trace is the the uh, the row in your multivariate test table you use when you've got one IV that has two levels. So um, in the example earlier where we're looking at voters and non-voters and whether they differ on uh, patriot or whether they vote due to sense of civic obligation or patriotism you got an IV with two levels hotel and trace is like the best one for that the other one that's in there is wilkes lambda and so wilkes lambda is sort of the multivariate test you would interpret if uh you had analysis with multiple independent variables so you can have like earlier this week that the, the two-way ANOVA you can have two-way MONOVA you can get crazy uh, if you wanted to but if you have multiple independent variables you use Wilkes Lambda or if you have an independent variable that's got three or more levels you'd interpret Wilkes Lambda it's just sort of like I mean I gotta be honest most of the time they don't differ that much so there are some other tests that are shown in there and I don't remember what they do so I don't expect you to Polize Trace and Roy's largest root. So they have their own sort of like application when they're best. Basically, someone got their um, their uh, uh, doctoral dissertation <laughs> by making some other sort of version of it for some other, you know, random circumstance. So if your multivariate test SIG is less than 0.05, then the alpha, uh, excuse me, then the IV groups differ on the combined centroid DVs. So the DVs combined. And if they differ on the combined DV, so hey, prisoners and non-prisoners differ on combined intelligence or whatever the example was, the question then begs, well, how <laughs> or why or, or, or you know, um, um, who's got the higher sort of combined mean? And so one of the weird things about this analysis is you don't get the centroid mean it's three-dimensional so it, it you don't have like a means table for the multivariate analysis all you know is these two groups differ on um, uh, the combined dependent variables so step-down analysis is basically simple effects that you do kind of like earlier this week for two-way ANOVA it's the simple effects for a MANOVA you um, and we'll, we'll talk about it and that's how you explore okay how do the groups differ on the combined DVs so once you uh, find a combined or a difference between the groups on the combined DVs, you will do step-down analysis for your significant multivariate tests. And um, these tests are the way, I, there's, there's actually multiple ways to do this, but I'm just gonna teach you one way. And uh, if you need to do something different, just send me an email during your dissertation. But uh, step-down analysis after a significant multivariate test looks for the relative importance of the DVs um, and the group differences that you found like so yeah the groups differ on the DVs combined well is one of these more important than the other does that sound like a hypothesis you heard earlier in the lecture yes so you want to identify what is sort of your most important DV or your primary DV um, based on your theory or hypothesis like uh, people vote because of civic obligation not because of sense of patriotism for example um, that would make civic obligation the more important uh, dependent variable you then order the remaining DVs from second most important, and if you got more, it'd be third most important, fourth most important, etc. So you order your dependent variables. Um, you know they differ. Um, the groups differ on your combined DVs, so you order them from most to least important for testing hypotheses, right, or theory, or whatever it is.
and then you follow the steps outlined below. You first conduct a follow-up test, which is called, or, uh, which is called a just a univariate ANOVA of the primary or most important DV. So you analyze that DV like the other one doesn't even exist, or the other ones don't even exist. So it is just a straight up uh, one-way ANOVA. Use a alpha, uh, Bonfroni corrected alpha level, that is uh, 0.05 divided by the number of DVs. So if you got two, it's gonna be 0.025, for example. Um, and it tests whether the independent variable groups differ on the primary DV of interest. It's nothing fancy about this. Like I said, we're just Taco Bell in it here and putting together, you know, the, the, the beans are, are on the tostada now and the meat is, you know, <clears throat> in the burrito. That's all that's going on. Can't believe I just said that. Anyway, um, uh, this tests whether the, the groups differ on the most important dependent variable. Then, um, uh, what you do is you run an ANCOVA, okay? So you already did your ANOVA, and it turns out it spits it out as part of the MANOVA. I'll just tell you that right now, it's the good news. Um, but then you do an analysis of covariance, where uh, you use the primary DV as a covariate, and you see if they differ on the next most important DV. So, um, from the prior week, we're going to do an ANCOVA now as follow-up test to a MANOVA. So this tests whether the independent variables groups differ on that secondary DV or next most important DV after removing differences associated with the primary DV, right? That's what ANCOVA does, uh, just for the effects of some other variables. So remember the variables, the DVs are supposed to be correlated here, so there should be some relationship between them. And so it says, um, do they still differ on the second DV after I take out uh, shared variability from the first DV? And again, use that alpha Bonfroni um, for that. Use, um, but use the alpha for the covariate, by the way. You don't like take it out if it's not significant, significant you leave it in. So if you have two, uh, more than two DVs, you just keep continuing. So if you had three DVs, for example, your first and the multivariate test is significant. Your first uh, uh, step down analysis step would be uh, for your most important DV, you do a univariate ANOVA, which like I said, is spit out just sort of as part of the MANOVA output anyway. The next step is do an ANCOVA on this, with the second most important DV as the DV and the primary DV as the covariate. This would say, you adjust for the first two DVs and see if they differ on the third one. So it sort of builds, it steps down. That's where the name comes from. So um, that's what it says here. You run an additional ANCOVA, the first and second. Most important DVs as covariates to see if they differ on the third. And again, keep using the alpha Bonferroni, which is alpha uh, divided by the total number of DVs you have, but use uh, alpha of 0.05 for the covariates see do they significantly adjust things and um, basically rinse and repeat keep doing this um, making tacos all day until um, uh, you run out of dvs to uh, see if they, the groups differ on your measure of effect size there isn't one for the manova <laughs> so there's no eta squared no omega squared no r squared nothing like that for the multivariate manova where it puts all the dvs together in this three-dimensional mean and by the way if you have three means uh three dvs it's more than three dimensions so it's it just gets crazy so this theoretical mean of all dvs combined for the step down uh univariate anova and ancovas it's just data squared again so the sum of squares for the iv divided by the sum of squares for the IV plus the sum of squares of the error. So it's that same formula, and you guys know what this thing tells you. Proportion of variability in the DV accounted for by the IV, right? All right, so APA format for the multivariate manoeuvre. This is a little different because we're going to use Hotelling's Trace, so I show you that. Uh, Hotelling's Trace equals, and you put it um, in there to two decimal points, and no one knows what Hotelling's Trace, like, no, no one sort of intuitively knows what the distribution looks like. Um, I guess you, you guys don't know either probably uh, any of these things, but like T, T distributions are, are normally distributed and chi-squares are positively skewed. And people who do this for a living, we kind of know that. Hotelling's trace, hell if I know <laughs> what that looks like if you plotted like infinite values, right? 
So they convert it to uh, an F test. Uh, uh, like here's what that would be if it was a F test. So that's why you first have hotel and trace. And then in comma, here's what that would be as an F test. And you just fill it in with the normal F stuff. Everything comes straight from your output. Now for your univariate ANOVAs and your step down tests, um, again, it's just an F test for each of those. That's all your ANOVA and ANCOVAs are, but you do add eta squared on there as calculated and shown above. All right, you ready to do one? I know you are. <clears throat> Why do people vote? A researcher hypothesizes that it is primarily a sense of civic obligation that accounts for whether or not someone votes rather than a sense of patriotism. So uh, reading that hypothesis, and, this, and again, guess what? Real data. So I try to use as much real data moving forward so you guys can see what other people have done uh, for their dissertations, even though it was uh, a psychology program, it still kind of gives you an idea of how people ask questions and formulate these things, which is something you're working on in your other course as well. So in here, they think the primary, like I literally uses the word primary, is sense of civic obligation. That's the most important DV. They think that's what differs most between people who vote and not. Um, and that that's why or how those groups differ, not really um, a sense of patriotism. So they have ordered their DVs. This is what the data look like. Each person's a row. That first column is uh, your independent variable. Again, you know, there's like ones and twos under those things, whether they voted or not. And then the next two columns are their DVs. Um, your I oh gosh look okay. why don't I just click things so DVs there's two of them um, higher means more for both so a higher civic obligation score means a person feels more sense of civic obligation same thing for patriotism DV1 that is your primary is sense of civic obligation DV2 secondary is uh, patriotism so first step are these DVs actually correlated? So remember, one of the assumptions here is that there is some sort of relationship between the DVs. So why not just do a quick correlation? Um, we're also going to throw in voting group just because it's so easy to do correlations. Um, <coughs> that uh, correlations are kind of like the scrambled eggs of stats. We just they're so easy to do. We do them all the time. So um, we're going to throw that in as well. There's our teeny tiny correlation matrix with everything thrown in. So for voting group and sense of civic obligation, they are correlated positively, 0.691. It's got stars, so it's significant. Also, six less than 0.05. So there is indeed a correlation. Those who have a higher sense of civic obligation also um, tend to be higher on uh, voting group. Well, what does higher on voting group mean? We'll look up above. <laughs> See, one didn't. So voting group only has two levels, right? One is you didn't vote, two is you voted. So what does it mean that as sense of civic obligation goes up, voting group goes up? Well, it means you voted, right? Because that would be a two, you were a two on this variable. So uh, I think it's a little easier to say the other way. Voters tend to have a higher sense of civic obligation. All right, bam. <clears throat> um, so how about voting group and patriotism? Boom, there's a correlation there. So patriotism and voting group, again, positive, again, significant. So um, what's that mean? Those who voted tended to have a higher sense of patriotism, right? So um, just because I know you guys hate this uh, correlation with the dichotomous nominal variables. Let me say it one more time because it's been a while. Voting group um, is positively correlated with patriotism. As a voting group goes up, patriotism tends to be higher. That's what a positive correlation means, right? So what does it mean when patriotism goes up? It means you're more patriotic. What does it mean when voting group goes up? Well, um, it means you're closer to a two. In fact, there's only ones and twos um, for voting groups. So it means you were a voter, you were a two. So higher voting group means you voted. So voters tended to um, have higher patriotism and a higher sense of civic obligation. So another of these are really why we did this. <laughs> why we did it is for that this third correlation here between sense of civic obligation and patriotism, also positively correlated, 0.53 if you round it, significant. Those who had a higher sense of civic obligation 
also tend to have a higher sense of patriotism. But 0.59 is a pretty hefty correlation. There's a pretty strong correlation between those variables, meaning they overlap a lot, right? So um, the correlations are consistent with the hypothesis that those who vote tend to do so because of a greater sense of civic obligation and patriotism, but they overlap a lot. So which one of those variables is more important? Let's see. <clears throat> So we're going to do the multivariate analysis, the MANOVA. This is where it's going to put combined sense of civic obligation and patriotism and tell us vote if voters and non-voters differ on that combined DV of both those together. So it's under multivariate. Um, I put both DVs in the dependent variables box. I put um, voting group and the fixed factors. That's what they call IVs in this particular analysis because they can't seem to keep their nomenclature straight and they hate us. Just kidding. So um, both of the TVs are in there now. Um, so I used MANOVA instead of two separate ANOVAs because this controls for type 1 error inflation. If the groups differ on either DV, this MANOVA will be statistically significant, whether it's one or both. Um, this maneuver will be statistically significant. That's how it actually uh, controls for type 1 error inflation. There's our descriptive stats. Hey, what's missing here? There is no mean of combined civic obligation and patriotism. Combined, right? You've got a mean of sense of civic obligation for those who voted or not. You got a means of patriotism for those who voted or not. You got total over both groups, but you don't have total total. Or, you know, like total squared or whatever. There's no overall total um, <clears throat> for sense of civic obligation combined. So, all right. These are the raw non covariate adjusted means, by the way. Just a reminder descriptive statistics. So, um, here's our multivariate test output. We normally skip over this table. We're not this time. Which one of these uh, rows are we going to use? First of all, we're going to go to this section for voting group because that's our independent variable. We're going to ignore intercepts, all intercept tests, and go straight to voting group. And we're going to use your hotelings trace for voting group. Why? Because hotelings trace is the best multivariate test to interpret when you have a uh, single independent variable with two levels. Note, however, the SIGs are like 0 0.000 for everything, and this is where I was saying it doesn't really seem to make much of a difference. How do these people get different degrees? I have no idea. Um, anyway, Pali versus Wilkes or whatever. So we're going to use Hotelling's Trace. There it is. So um, because our SIG is less than 0.05, we know that those who did and did not vote differ significantly on combined sense of civic obligation and patriotism. Well, sweet. How? <laughs> do they differ on both things or one thing or what's going on here? So um, I do show you here how you um, APA format for your hotelings trace. It's 0.995, so that rounds basically to one. So it's hotelings trace of one is the equivalent of an F of 2 and 5, 57 degrees of freedom, 28.37. So because the ANOVA is significant, we're going to do step down analysis to figure how they differ on these DVs. So this step, we are going to do an ANOVA, okay? An ANOVA on the primary dependent variable, that is sense of civic obligation, because the hypothesis was that's why people vote. And it turns out that um, it's automatically printed on your output for your ANOVA. We're gonna use a bond for any corrected alpha level of 0.025, there's two DVs. So we're gonna use 0.05 divided by two. This is what that output looks like. It's basically a rec. Um, lots of junk in here. Go to the one that says voting group. That's what we need. There's our means. There's voting group. And note under voting group, there is not only is there an ANOVA for sense of civic obligation, there's also one for patriotism. But we're going to ignore the one for patriotism because that's the secondary DV and that's the one we have to do an ANCOVA in a sec. So anyway, do um, those who vote and not significantly differ on sense of civic obligation, what the researcher hypothesized as the most important dependent variable. That's why I put the means up there. Um, indeed they do. SIG is less than 0.025. So those who voted had a higher sense of civic obligation than those who did not vote. Probably not, not a shocker, right? So there's the APA format for that. It's just normal um, uh, F test except for the eta squared.
the eta squared is the um, sum of squares for the IV. That is this gigantic number, 8,592.07 um, divided by the sum of uh, 8,592.067 plus 9417867, the error. And there's my cuckoo clock. So um, about that's actually big, about 48% of the variability, if you scooch that eta squared decimal over, 48% of uh, variability in um, sense of specific obligation can be uh, predicted by whether you voted or not. So we're at our final step. So we know they differ on sense of civic obligation. Those who voted have a higher sense of civic obligation. So if we remove differences between voters and non-voters for sense of civic obligation, do they still differ in patriotism? Which is a backwards way of answering the question, why do people vote? Is it civic, sense of civic obligation or is it patriotism? So um, we posit it's actually the former. So we're going to do an ANCOVA of patriotism. So patriotism is the DV. Our independent variable is still the same one. But we're going to adjust for civic obligation. That becomes a covariate. Our primary um, DV becomes a covariate for the secondary DV. Use the same darn bond for any corrected alpha level, 0.025. Um, but for the covariate, we use 0.05. So remember where this was, general linear model, univariate. Um, I'm in univariate, and what have I done? Well, patriotism is now the DV, right? That's the secondary DV. Voting group, still fixed factor, still the IV. But now civic obligation is there under uh, covariate, all right? So we're going to adjust for differences between voters and non-voters for sense of civic obligation and see if they still differ uh, in patriotism or if they differ in patriotism. And you gotta remember to get the covariate adjusted means, by the way. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> so here is the results of our ANCOVA of, of patriotism using sense of civic obligation as a covariate. So it's just a Nova Alpo with lots of garbage in there again. So first thing we get is civic obligation as a row. That is the covariate, right? So that covariate row tells you whether um, uh, sense of civic obligation significantly adjusted the means for patriotism, <laughs> right? Because it's covariate. So it's like uh, uh, age and sex were in, in one of the prior analyses, for example. We're adjusting for sense of civic obligation. The SIGs less than 0 0.05, so that tells us, yeah, civic obligation did adjust the patriotism means, okay? Um, do uh, the groups, do voters and non-voters differ in patriotism after you remove differences in their sense of civic obligation? Uh, there's the means from estimated marginal means. You gotta remember, use the covariate adjusted ones, not the descriptives ones, which are the crude ones. And it's 111 versus 120-ish, right? And the answer is no. 0 .11, 0 0.121 is not less than 0 0.05. So um, that, that eight point difference or whatever it is there, nine point difference in the adjusted means um, is not statistically significant. So um, those who voted did not significantly differ in patriotism from those who did vote after adjusting for sense of civic obligation. P was greater than 0.025, the Bonferroni corrected alpha level. There's how you write that sucker up, your ANCOVA in um, APA format. A squared, not a big deal. Um, it's 556, five, the sum of squares for voting group, divided by the sum of squares for voting group again, 556, five, plus the error, which is 12,800. <laughs> gigantic number. Anyway, that's about 0 0.04. So what, what do you tell grandma? Um, <clears throat> well, what you tell grandma is after removing variability in patriotism scores that's accounted for by sense of civic obligation, voters and non-voters do not significantly differ in their level of patriotism. So it's kind of a backwards way of saying, look, um, the biggest difference between voters and non-voters is sense of civic obligation, not sense of patriotism. Because when we remove sense of civic obligation, they don't significantly differ in patriotism. And so remember in uh, ANCOVA, you do this thing where you have the unadjusted and the adjusted means. So you got to do that same thing here um, for uh, the secondary dependent variables. Um, 
This does suggest indeed that people primarily vote due to a sense of civic obligation as opposed to a sense of patriotism. So remember that the unadjusted means, and this is for patriotism that go in here, um, because patriotism was adjusted for sense of civic obligation, you wanna see how did those things change, right? The unadjusted means come from the descriptives table. The adjusted means um, come from the estimated marginal means table. And if you look at the bars, how the bars differ from each other, they get closer together when you adjust for sense of civic obligation. They no longer significantly differ. So there is a step down ANCOA summary table that goes into your APA write up. And so you gotta take this thing. Um, that's all you need and say crossing stuff out here. I highlight, here's the stuff you actually need. Um, oh, I do cross it out. <laughs> Remember you need to sum these manually. You can't use total or corrected total. And you need to see rainbow bar fat into an APA format table in your uh, APA write up. So what is different here? Note at the bottom of the table, you've got two different star thingies, notes, star notes, significance notes, I guess it's technically the term. Um, and uh, uh, a single star means the sig was less than 0.05, that's what's used for your covariate. A double star, more significanter, which isn't a word, but I think you get the idea, is two stars, that was uh, your P was less than 0.025, your bond for any corrected alpha level. And again, don't forget, you gotta hand calculate the total sum of squares and degrees of freedom.